Thank you so much for joining us here today. My name is Frederick Gross, and I'm joined here with Sydney Sykes, and we're both the co-founders of Black VC. And we're here today to introduce what's about to be an incredibly powerful conversation with leaders in the venture community. We've been lucky to get to know these investors as speakers and as mentors and as friends throughout the last five year journey that Sydney and I have been on in building this incredible organization that is Black VC. And while today Black VC has gone above and beyond what we ever originally thought about it, at the core, the conversation today goes at what we originally were hoping to build, which was a community of like-minded investors willing to work together, have honest conversations and share the playbooks on how to be successful as fundamentally great investors here in venture capital. Today, Black VC has grown to be the largest black venture community in the United States with six chapters across the country. And it continues to just be an incredible honor and privilege for Sydney and I to see the community and to serve the community as it stands today. Black VC is built on three core pillars. The first is growing the number of black venture investors in the community. The second is ensuring the success and the promotion of those investors and with the goal of ensuring that we're growing the number of actual black check writers in the community. And the last is focused on being stewards of community data. And that's this last pillar that we're really excited about diving into here today. I'd like to echo Frederick's point in thanking you for joining us today. This event is a companion to the first inaugural State of Black Venture Report from Black BC. This report is meant to illustrate the experience as well as the importance of Black venture investors, especially senior Black venture investors today. We've invited three speakers here today for this panel to talk about and illustrate that experience. We have Elliot Robinson, partner at Bessemer Venture Partners. We have Sydney Thomas, principal at Precursor Ventures. And we have Henri Pierre Jacques, managing partner at Harlem Capital. Elliot worked his way up to be partner at Bessemer after more than a decade of VC experience. Sydney, on the other hand, joined Precursor in the early days of the first fund and has grown with the firm and been promoted to principal over time. And finally, Henri, who started a firm after years of experience in finance to fill a gap that existed in the venture ecosystem. Each of these speakers represents a different path and a different experience for a senior black venture investor, but they also represent important trends in the venture capital ecosystem today that are contributing to what we hope long-term will turn into greater representation of black investors. We also think this event today and these speakers will bring to life the data. These are not just individual anecdotes, they're examples of trends we're seeing throughout the ecosystem. We urge you to not only watch this event and listen to these speakers, but to download the inaugural State of Black Venture Report. It has incredible pieces of information around how the Black Venture experience has expressed itself, as well as the trends and what we see happening in the future. We also encourage you to work with us to continue to diversify venture capital and to help us create a community for the future of venture capital. Now, I'd like to hand it over to John Chena, president of SVB Capital. Silicon Valley Bank has been an incredible partner, and they were crucial in creating the State of Black Venture Report. John's going to talk a little bit about what the State of Black Venture Report means to Silicon Valley Bank and why they thought this topic and this report was so important to our ecosystem. Hello, everyone. My name is John Chena, and I'm the president of SVB Capital. As the bank of the innovation economy, Silicon Valley Bank is the go-to financial partner for founders and investors in the innovation ecosystem. Given the strength of our position, SVB is actively working to drive diversity across the entire ecosystem. And we are so proud to be the founding partner of this first state of Black Venture Report. Our goal is to promote a deeper understanding and inspire ideas to promote positive change. We encourage you to read the report and think about things you and we collectively can do differently and can do better. I celebrate the report finding that black venture investors are making their own paths to success and working to create even stronger networks. The number of black check writers is slowly increasing. 
in large part because they are launching new funds. About a quarter of them have just started a new fund in the past two years. Black investors have an outsized impact on the next generation of black investors and founders. Half are actively mentoring other investors in the black DC community. Still, systemic barriers remain. Black investors have more capital influence today and they are leveraging their networks to open up new opportunities for themselves and their community. Still, black partners and fund managers continue to face significant fundraising and investing obstacles. We must do better. Here's my call to action. Let's work to change perspectives about who makes a successful entrepreneur and investor and blow up the boulders holding back progress. Greater inclusion is imperative for the success of the entire ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Thank you so much, SVB. It's been a pleasure to work on this report with you all. Um, I'm excited to jump into the main part of this event, which is a panel discussion with three uh, black investors. We introduced them previously, but so excited to have Henri, Sydney, and Elliot here to talk a little bit about their black experience in venture capital. Just to jump right into the questions, um, we mentioned earlier that you guys represent three different experiences uh, of black investors in venture capital, but I, I want to start with Sydney um, and then move around a little bit. Um, Sydney, you've been at Precursor basically since inception. You climbed the ranks at Precursor. You've now been there, seen subsequent funds. Um, how has your experience been taking on new roles and new funds? Oh man, that's such a good question. Um, so to, I guess to level set a little bit, you that was really great leveling the playing kind of like overview of where I started because when I started, it, I think we had raised maybe five million dollars, and so it was very much just an idea, and so very much I'd say even like a pre-seed company, and so a lot of the role, and I'm actually writing a blog post right now, breaking out all the things I've done, fund by fund by fund, because I actually haven't just sat and thought about all of it before. It is wild. Fund one was so much about building. It was like, how do we do all the things? How do we think about pre-seed, especially in 2016 when pre-seed wasn't really a thing? How do we think about diversification of a stra as a strategy more generally, serving lots of founders? Um, how do I really just like figure out my own footing in venture as someone who had just launched her career in this space? and also um, was just trying to think through like, what are the best practices, if any, of how to actually excel here. And then I'd say fun two was a lot more focused around, okay, I think I have a sense of things. We're not, we've done a little bit. We have like companies are doing okay. We're moving on to kind of like this next trajectory of, of infrastructure. And so it was, um, there's this really good article about like giving away all your Legos, which is very true in startup land. And I think also applies to scaling a VC firm in that I created all of these things. And then I basically had to either automate them or give them away so that I could take on new roles so that I could be successful then more as someone who was sourcing companies, working with investors, um, really developing my brand. And then fund three was that all over again where I was like, okay, I need to give away more Legos, have other people on the team do more sourcing, have other people on the team do more marketing work, so that now I can actually focus on actually investing in the companies and then focusing my time on supporting those companies. And so uh, the, I guess the hardest part about it has been, there's not a lot of, um, I say it's like public discussion about what that looks like. I think a lot of folks in venture not that common to raise through the rings. It's common to leave <laughs> and start your own fund. And so there's all the conversations, all the feedback I was getting was like, oh, okay, well, actually, when you do this, then you start your fund. And then when you do this, you start your fund. And there was no real like, okay, but how do you actually like make this work? How do you actually like acknowledge that this role is different? How do you actually ask for different types of support? And so a lot of that has been also learnings in fund for now too. That's honestly so much of what we talk about in the report is that there, there's this different 
um, these different paths to being in venture. And some of them are spurred by the market. Some of them are spurred by the number of black people in venture. But there's honestly been kind of these transitions over time. And you mentioned, you know, people who have jumped straight into starting their own funds. So Henri would be a great example of that. And I want to get to you later, Henri, but um, Elliot is that example of what you talked about of, of being at different funds. And Elliot, you've been in venture for quite a few years. Um, you're likely the most tenured person on this call, I believe. Uh, and, and you've been at a few different firms. What was driving your decision when you were deciding to go to, the, to new firms? Yeah. Um... You know, the short answer is opportunity. Uh, the other side of that answer is lack of opportunity, quite frankly. Um, you know, having started my venture career in 2006, the structure of a venture fund is a unique one. It's if you're not a solo GP, you're in a partnership model or a solo GP considering making other GPs or managing partners, right? So it's this reverse pyramid structure typically. Um, and you, you find yourself after two or three years saying, okay, I can do this part of the job. Then as Sydney was alluding to, I can put these Legos aside. Now I can do this part of the job. But the reality is, and I try to remind people all the time, we're in a fixed fee structure in our business. The only thing that you really represent as a junior investment professional is cost an opportunity cost to a founding GP or managing GP or any other GP. So you really have to be able to show that value. And sometimes the math just doesn't work. You know what your value is and what you're bringing to the firm. For them to open up those doors or economics to a new party means it's somewhat dilutive. We can debate what that actually means based on the value you bring. But as I went through a couple of three and four and five year stints at other firms, I saw a lack of opportunity to have the the control and economics and decision-making power that I wanted. Um, but, you know, I also saw an opportunity in going to Georgian Partners of moving to Toronto and getting, although it's not like the most international uh, kind of experience, it is a totally different investment landscape. And quite frankly, it's how I got to know Bessemer through a co-investment in what at the time was a small Ottawa-based company called Shopify which turned into like a great outcome for everyone involved. So, you know, it, it really was as a black, <clears throat> excuse me, a black investment professional, you know, there's a real nuance as to what opportunities exist in larger funds as you rise through the ranks. Uh, and quite frankly, um, back in 2010 or 12, when I wanted to test the waters of raising my own fund, it's also worth mentioning, and then I'll shut up, I focus on growth stage companies. So the average investment for me is probably a 30 to $40 million check. I've gone as small as 17 and as large as 175. So for me to go build a portfolio, I need to find an LP base that's comfortable with me and maybe one or two other folks, raising probably three to 500 million out of the gate. That model doesn't exist for us, or at least back then it did not exist for us. I had LPs running through the door in my email saying, I want to back you, here's a, a $3 million commitment, here's a $5 million commitment, and that's awesome. But it's so shocking that they're willing to back me for a strategy and investment practice that I had no track record in. I'm not cool enough to be a seed investor, I don't have the clothes, I don't get invited to Miami. You know, I do growth stage, enterprise SaaS, and digital health for the most part. And when I took that pitch to the LP community saying, hey, I need three to 500 out of the gate to build a portfolio of 10 to 15 companies, highly convicted 20 to $30 million checks, there was just no interest. And I think to date, there still hasn't been interest for that play for us. Um, perhaps in the future that, that play exists and we're doing a lot of work to make that happen. Yeah, that, that's definitely like something I want to dive into later because there's this question of what does opportunity look like now, even if five people are able to raise funds, you know, more, more able to raise funds. Um, can they raise the types of funds they need to or want to? But, but first, I want to give Henri a chance to sort of react to what's been said, because Henri is sort of an example of someone who was able to, to start a fund. You know, I guess one, we'd love to hear your reaction to what uh, Elliot's been saying, but also want to hear, did you ever think about going to join a fund as a, a route to reach your goals? Or did you always know that 
starting your own fund was the right track for you? Um, I mean, I always knew I was going to start a fund. I didn't think it would be as early as we did. So my background is more investment banking, private equity, business school, and then venture capital. So we started the fund six years ago as angel investors. So Jared and I, my partner, worked at the same black owned private equity firm. We were cue mates and we were like, hey, why don't we invest our own money similar to what we're doing at work? So Harlem Capital started as an angel syndicate with six uh, black friends who all did MLT together and lived in Harlem. Uh, and so that's how it started. And you know, fast forward three years later, Jared and I are roommates at Harvard Business School, started recruiting after working in ICV, didn't want to work for a firm that had no black partners because all partners at ICB were black. Also didn't want to work for a firm that didn't invest in people of color because our angel syndicate, we weren't diversity focused in, but almost all of our deals were diverse led because we were like, we're going to invest our own money. We wanted to invest in our communities. So that pretty much like, you know, back then, this is 2017, you essentially had Precursor, which I think was like 15 million then. You had 645, which was 8 million then. It was like, you know, these firms, like they just couldn't, like we, there was no capacity to hire us. Right. And so essentially it was like, okay, well, we want to work for black people and we want to invest in people of color. <laughs> like we basically got to start our own fund. And, and that's like really what happened, you know? So I got a fellowship at Harvard business school that would, you know, give me 600 bucks a week. And Jared was still recruiting. And I was like, Hey, I got this fellowship. Like you want to join me. Uh, I can get them to add you on to it. Like, let's just go like raise a fund instead of doing an internship. And so June of 2018, we launched the fund between our first and second year of business school. And then second year of business school, you know, really was in New York four days a week fundraising and was, you know, fortunate for it to work out. But like nobody was doing what we wanted. I didn't really want to work for another fund, even though ICB was black owned. We had no black CEOs. We had one woman CEO who we eventually fired. I was tired of investing in white people in Iowa and middle of America. Uh, you know, it's good money, a lot of lessons. and. I think there was a lot of value from being black owned, but I think I wanted the next level. Like I wanted to be diverse owned and diversity focused and they just didn't exist. And so for me, I wasn't really doing venture capital because I like wanted to be a venture capitalist. It was just, I knew from ICB because ICB actually started, it stands for inner city ventures. So ICB started in 1998 as a black owned private equity firm to invest in private equity companies, right? And eventually it pivoted because they realized there wasn't enough of a market to invest in diverse companies that were 10 million plus of EBITDA. Um, and so I knew just from that ICB experience and talking to Willie, like, hey, if we want to invest in people of color, though I come from private equity, like there's not enough capacity for me to raise a fund today that's focused on people of color at the growth equity stage, right? And so uh, to some extent, like we were forced to go early stage because we just, we were more obsessed with the problem than we were the market and where the problem in the market existed was early stage for people, people of color. It's so like long term, our goal is to be a multi stage fund. Like, we've always wanted to go to growth equity, private equity at some point, but like, you can't, you can't force that the market doesn't exist. That's, that's what we saw a lot in the report as well, or, or in the, the survey results was even if there are more black investors starting firms, more black investors becoming partners, mostly because they're starting firms or joining earlier firms, it's often the result of, a lack of opportunity elsewhere. Okay, I, I couldn't um, go to this larger fund and do the type of investments I want. 83% of the black partners in our survey said that they either launch their own fund or transition to a new firm in order to get to that senior level. Um, and it sounds like you had a very specific thesis as well and there was a goal and there was um, opportunity based on the work that you were doing, but there was also this issue of supply constraint in the market of, you know, there's just not enough firms that are doing or able to do what I want to do. Um, you know, I feel like that really relates to what Elliot was talking about earlier in terms of the late stage investor. Uh, I'll say it bluntly, and then I want to hear you kind of go off on this, but I know you're an expert. Why do you feel like there are so few black check writers in the series A and later investing yeah, I mean, I, I can just give you one person's perspective. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the industry is just filled with a bunch of bullshit diversity theater. Like that's that's just the real answer. Um, you know, I think I was quoted in the Washington Post in 2020 for saying there's a big difference between partners and partners. And I think we've made a lot of partners recently who have titles but no check writing authority. So it looks great in the press release. It even shows up in some of the reports and research and improvements of what's happening in venture. 
but nothing's not, nothing is way too strong. Very little has changed um, beyond the titling, uh, and it certainly hasn't necessarily changed in the roles, responsibilities, and then ultimately the economics, which has huge downstream um, effects. The, the real answer is it starts with the LP community. Uh, that's like honestly the real answer. Um, you know, I do have to give a shout out to Willie Woods. He was one of my early mentors, um, also a Morehouse man. Uh, I started my career at what is still today the, the largest and most successful black owned venture fund and Syncom Venture Partners. And it was always baffling to me. Like we had all the returns, all the things where I'm from in Virginia, we call it go fetch a rock. And what that means is we had the team, we had the tenure, we had the returns, we had the portfolio companies, but LPs would still um, treat us differently. We were still in the emerging manager program 34 years into the fund's life. I'm like, what are we emerging from? Like, basically it's just a room or a line or a separate water fountain you have to go to because they don't see us as equal when it comes to being stewards of their capital. So, you know, this is a long, wrong, long, uh, round trip story, but one of the things that I think is most important for folks like myself and Sydney and Henri and, and our colleagues is to make sure that as we achieve and as we scale and ultimately return capital, the very thing that we have this partnership structure to do, uh, we have very honest conversations with them about funding the ecosystem, not our funds, not our investment practices or our individual companies, but the ecosystem. Um, I'll end on this, that the best days that I can have, I started my day uh, texting with a dear friend that we all know, I'm not gonna put them out there, but they're raising a new fund, um, likely more than twice their size of their last fund. And the ability to call on shared LPs, where they might be 50 million in my fund, but now we can get them to be five or 10 in, in a sizable fund. That's the best day that I can have as a, as a tenured black venture capitalist because that's how the ecosystem changes so that when I'm thinking about the next career move or Henri is in business school thinking about, do I start a fund? Do I go get some experience or Sydney the same thing? There's capacity. That's really at the heart of your question. And if the LP dollars aren't there, no matter how smart we are, no matter how networked we are, no matter how great we are, there won't be capacity to rise the ecosystem in the way that I know we all wanna see it be, you know, even five years from now. Yeah, I, lo I love that Elliot called it the, the, the bullshit theater because now we're getting real. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think it's, it's, it's similar for every industry, right? So like, what I think about when I was in banking, my group had 45 people. I was the only black person, 45 people. I just had dinner last week here in Miami. Um, my, some of the former bankers moved here. So there's one black MD in all of Bank of America today. Uh, there were two black directors. Now there's one and both of them live here. So we had dinner and it's like, I was the only black analyst. This is the only black MD. This is the only black director, right? You think about the same thing for private equity. There's one black partner at TPG. There's one black partner at KKR. There's one at Blackstone. Carlisle has none. Apollo has none, right? This is like, there's every asset class, like it's, it's an issue. And I think part of it, which is why another reason I wanted to leave, because I realized like, and then those black partners at those funds, like are not even partners in the main fund, which, you know, to Elliot's point, we call big P partner versus little P partner, right? So you've got a bunch of little P partners who aren't even partners in the main fund. They're whatever real estate fund or some side vehicle, not the main fund. And so it was just very apparent, right? And the same is true for Fortune 500s. Uh, I think there's less black CEOs today than there were 20 years ago. Um, and so I think it's just, it's just like corporate America, right? And whether it's, you know, racism or hierarchical structure, it's like, I think it's just been proven time and time again and I think we're at a point now, which is why you see so many fund managers. I was talking to a fund to fund. They have a hundred diverse managers are looking at now that are raising funds. Like people are just tired of going through the system, right? And so I think to some extent, and I think about this question philosophically often, uh, talking to my grandfather, because he started the Black Social Network, like are black people better off today than they were, you know, in the 60s? Like you look at like actual statistics, there's more segregation today than there were during Jim Crow laws based on like where people lived. Right. And so I think it's just like fascinating to think about, like at what point do people continue to try to change this system versus start their own? I think different people, like, there's no right or wrong answer. I think just for me, when I looked at all these things and like, who are my mentors at these larger funds, and whatever asset class it was, I just realized I can't, like, I, I just didn't want to wait 20 years to potentially be a little B partner 
at these funds. And I think some people are going to go through that and it takes a certain level, of, you know, like little cuts that you're taking on a daily basis. And some people are like, Hey, it's just not worth it for me. And I'm not, I don't have the mental capacity uh, to like take this option. And that's just like how that was like my choice, but for other people, they have a different choice. But I think it's really hard. You can look across multiple different types of investments and like, you'll see this, like it's systemic. I love that. And I love Anri, bringing like your Haitian vibes to this conversation. I feel like you're like, let's burn it all down. It's very Haitian. And so, but I really think it's interesting to, to point out the, um, just like the, what your internal calculation is. And so I think you talked about this a little bit. I think Elliot talked about this a little bit. It's like, I don't know if we as kind of like a community give ourselves enough time to just like sit down and reflect on like, what are your unique personal goals? Because I think a lot of times we start thinking immediately, okay, well, what does the community expect from me? And then what do I need to do to like, you know, support all the black people everywhere? And like, how do I move the needle on all of these things? And it's like, but like, who are you? <laughs> you know, like, what do you want to do with your career? What do you want to do with your life? And I think that that's where the question needs to start. Um, and then once you have a little bit more clarity on that, and obviously it's going to change, honestly, every week, month, year, I think you can be a little bit more honest in what you actually want to do with it. Like, do you want to join a fund? Do you want to start a new fund? Do you care even about the continued growth of Black VCs in venture capital at all? You might not. And I think that we just need to have like these very honest conversations with ourselves um, in order for us to get to to wherever we need to go. I think this con this allowing ourselves to be this very diverse, multicultural um, community because that's what we are. Yeah, th there's this age old debate in the black community around um, when, when can I do what's right for me? it feels like there's so much onus to do what's right for your community and the allies around you and, and you know the, the white people have supported you and, and the schools that have, have taken you as far in spite of the some of the toxic energy that happens around that related to race. Um, and I think all of us have experienced going that extra mile. I mean, the, the thing I was saying to, to Fred the other day um, before Black History Month is, oh, it's almost Black History Month. I'm about to get twice as more, twice as busy. I am about to have another job somehow. Um, and one of the things that, that came across in the report, just to bring it back around and, and stop the venting, is that uh, we found that over 50% of Black partners are actively mentoring or hiring Black talent. And I think if you look at the average firm in venture capital, I don't really think that's true or it doesn't look the way that it looks in the black community. And so I'm, I'm curious for all of you, I'd love to start with Sydney, but what, is, what have black mentors done for you? And also, I guess, what is that, that standard or that um, subliminal onus meant for your experience? It's a great question. And I think that, um, also at the beginning of my career, there are so many things that I was telling myself too. I, you guys remember 2016 slash 2015 BC. It was just a different world. And because of it, I was very, very extremely self-conscious about my race and my gender. And so I took all of the feedback that I was getting from each one of these kind of like micro interactions, trying to sort out like all of the different pieces, like, oh, when they said this, this, did they really mean this? And then if they did this, does this really mean this? And because I had no connection to VC, um, my background is actually in the public sector. And so when I was making that transition, I was cold emailing and cold LinkedIn-ing everyone. And so I treated it much like a sales process. I cold emailed, you know, hundreds of people, a percentage of that people got back to me. And then a smaller percentage of that people actually wanted to see me IRL. And then a percentage of that people were actually useful. And um, some of the people who got back to me early on were black people. Some of the people who got back to me early on were Jewish people. They were, but they were all people who had a um, experience of being discriminated against in some way, shape or form. 
And the way that they showed up to me, showed up for me was honestly giving me the space to actually tell my story, refine my story, um, ask for things. And that's how I was, you know, pushed in the direction of hanging out with Frida Kapoor, who then actually introduced me to Charles, who at that point was doing a lot of things. And so I basically also treated my relationship with him very early on as a sales process. I called him every month and basically was like, do you have a job for me yet? You know, no, next month. Do you have a job for me yet? No, next month. And I did that for six months. And even then I got a part-time job. And so, um, but I got a job. And so I milked it for all it was worth. And I think that as I've grown with NBC2, so much of kind of the ability for me to both I think it's the early years I took a lot on about mentoring younger folks in BC because I was like, oh man, I got my foot in the door. Come on, come on. You know, like I just opened the door a little bit, like run through with me. And eventually I realized how um, much more, I guess, valuable it would be for me to actually write. And so I actually transitioned a lot of my work of mentorship from having these one-on-one -on -one calls to actually just sharing out what I've learned via writing. Because I think that's one thing about Venture 2 that is just really weird is that junior people don't talk. They don't talk publicly. There's a lot of this kind of like cone of silence that I see that once a junior person gets into a big BC firm, they can only talk about the deals. That's it. Or like their idea about a research project. They can't talk about what day-to-day -day life is, what they learned in the last week, um, how they're thinking about their next role. And so I wanted to be that for folks where I could actually share very publicly and very openly and very honestly about all the good, bad, and the ugly with the hope that it illuminated the path for others as well. Yeah, um, I, I think that the, those are such good points. I wanted to quickly bring it to Elliot, the same question. You mentioned being at one of the oldest Black-led venture firms. What role did mentorship play for you? And what has that experience been like now that you're a, a senior person? Man, there's so many things I'm gonna try to squeeze into two minutes. Um, so look, the, the only question that I, it's a two-part question I ask myself every morning uh, when I'm brushing my teeth and every night when I'm brushing my teeth. And it's, am I proud of what I did today and that I ride for my people? If I didn't accomplish those two things, then I fucking fail. Like that, that's just how I think of it. You can decide where you live on that spectrum. You can be off it or somewhere on it. That's fine. That's how I think about my day. Um, so what does that, what does that mean? Uh, that means as you go through your venture capital career, <laughs> one thing that I think is about to happen that a lot of folks aren't ready for. Um, we've gone through this up into the right market dynamic here for the last seven or eight, maybe even 10 years. I started my career in 2006. Um, you know, I shared something around Black History Month around my first investment where I actually got to lead it, present it, stood up in front of my LPs and presented this deal. One of the largest investments in Syncom's history and a company called Clear Security. You see it in the airport or now at stadiums. Um, invested in the company and within six months the company was bankrupt. Now if you really want to know what mentorship means to you, you stand in front of your partners, your LPs, and what happened was, you know, the 08, 09 collapse happened is what happened. And this, the biggest customers were Wall Street banks and consultancies. And they all turned away from being customers. I basically moved to New York for three months and tried to turn the company around and successfully the company did turn around. But man, the mentorship I got in like the hardest market periods around my own, you know, we all deal with imposter syndrome. You make investment decisions, you write about it, you tweet about it, you blog about it, you talk about it, and you don't know if they were the right decisions for five to seven years. So you're always trying to figure it out in the middle. But when something fails, like abject failure. I believe that's when, when mentorship really, really means something. So I think we're unfortunately about to enter a period where people have all these paper marks and raise these like crazy price rounds and some reckoning in reality is about to happen. And having mentors to help guide you through that, that place uh, is gonna be abundantly important. And then the last thing I'll say, 
is just about the community and what it means to mentor someone who's about to wrap up their 16th year in venture capital. If there's one thing I've learned from uh, MLT or Twigo or Kaufman Fellows, it's this whole idea of you know finding your superpowers or your zone of genius. Um, and I believe that for people who come from where we come from, who are black in venture capital, you will never achieve applying your zone of genius or superpower until you really, really get comfortable with being your full self in this ecosystem. And it's tough. Like there's there's some reality and some trade-offs to doing that. I fundamentally am myself. I wear J's to work every day. I've got my DJ equipment in the office because that's who I am. That's what makes me most comfortable and happy. So the people that I, I mentor, particularly people of color and, and women, it really like if you don't know how much energy you spend trying to be someone you're not to fit into this ecosystem and until you have someone who's senior enough to look at you and tell you you're the smartest fucking person in here but you will not achieve your your full potential until you get comfortable and i, I got your back on being fully comfortable take all that energy from trying to be something else and fitting in and be a cultural ad. That's one thing that I talk about a lot is don't try to be a cultural fit, be a cultural ad. You gotta be really confident in, in what that means for you. And, and hopefully to go back to your question, you've got a mentor or someone who can help you uh, kind of walk that walk and live that experience. Yeah, and I think the way I got into venture, so the summer between private equity and business school, I had three months off and I'd never worked in venture in turn. So I literally, which is actually how our diverse founder report, our VC report started. I scrubbed like as many black VCs as I could. I think I found like 75 people and I ended up talking to like 35 that summer um, in order to like prepare for, for VC fundraising. And then like my friend, Megan Maloney, who used to be at GC and then Kai Bond, who was a Comcast at the time uh aaron from 645 like i was like this time i met these people it was like the linkedin dms and uh messages and like literally that summer i was just on calls and hearing their experiences and like what is venture like what does it mean but like i wanted from the beginning i wanted a black experience i wanted to be at firms that had other black people so i only taught the firms that had black people that i knew uh, and so that was really helpful just to like get that mentorship because even in banking like i was the only black person but i did seo and so like i knew the only black person of every group at the bank. And so like we would meet up for lunch or I would, like go walk on their floor. And so it's like, you're the only one, but at least I had other people in the same building. So I was like, I'm not going to be the only one at your firm. That's just not going to happen for me. Um, so that was super helpful. Like before I got in, just like talking to people and they were super receptive and half the people I reached out to responded. And now a lot of, a lot of them are my friends. I think it's just knowing you're not the only one and seeing that it's possible. Like it's not necessarily mentorship, so to speak, but like, it just frees you uh, to, to Elliot's point to like be yourself. I think that's really valuable. Like I think the biggest change of going to ICV and being at a black home PE firm was like I tell people your mentality goes from defense to offense and you don't realize how much energy you waste trying to be defensive and like think about things like did I make the wrong mistake and once you're at a black home firm and you're offensive and like I'm just doing whatever I want and not ever like questioning like are they to not hire another black person like how do they view this? Like I was just like, I was crushing it, like at a whole different level. Uh, and so I think once I got that experience, I was like, I wanna be in environments that like make me offensive. There, there's a lot of burden on people's shoulders to feel like they have to represent for, for other black investors, for the black entrepreneurs, for kind of everyone in their community. And so what can the black community do when you take away some of that burden? I want to switch the discussion a little bit because we touched on the LP rule, um, but it's really important. It's really important to um, precursor when they raised their fund a few years, their first fund a few years back, and now on, on their subsequent funds, it was really important to Henri, you making your transition into full-time venture through raising a fund. It was important for Elliot when he was talking about where he felt there were opportunities and potential. I guess just to quickly start with Henri, and then I want to move around a bit, is uh, I want to understand the, the importance of LPs. So what we saw in the report was that Black fund managers are mostly raising from high net worths and family offices, which are typically smaller LPs. Why do you think that Black fund managers typically aren't getting money from these larger institutional LPs? Yeah. Um... 
So, I mean, I think part of it is they're, they're less willing to take risks. And so, I mean, you know, we were fortunate in fund one, we had six institutions and in fund two, we had 17. And we thought about this and we actually spoke to a lot of black managers. CPG was our, our anchor investor in fund one and, and took a GP stake, which is public information. And a lot of managers we spoke to were like, oh, like, you know, why would you do that? And when we looked at it, right, like Willie Woods ICB was backed by the Sears family office. Robert Smith basically got backed by Brockman. Frank Baker at Series Capital, you know, similar, they basically got backed and sponsored. Like all the large managers of color, like had people who took stakes in their funds early on. That was pretty clear. The managers who didn't kind of remained in this like 50 to 200 million. And like, we've always told people we want to raise a billion dollars over a decade, like that's our goal. And so I think just like given like what we wanted and like what we saw and who our mentors were, it was pretty clear, like, unfortunately, like this was just the reality for managers of color who wanted to scale, that they had to get staked and you had to get this white approval. And it worked, like getting TBD definitely worked. And our view is like, we'd always rather have more, we'd rather have more of less and less of more. Um, and so I think that's just the case. I think you know, what we saw was like, how we got the six institutions, like we were talking to people where initially it's like, oh, you're too small. Like we don't do $5 million checks. And then eventually like we got some of these fund managers to be LPs in our fund and they either were on the boards of these organizations. Um, and then like they would end up being investors. Like one of our, one of our fund the funds that came in, uh, they came in through the SMA because the pension fund invested in fund one and like that pension fund is their second largest client, right? Another one, we got two institutions because, um, somebody at TPG was on the board of two of the institutions, right? Like, that's not the only reason they invested, but like, it's a reason for you to kind of like remove your check boxes. I think the check boxes are so much darker lines, literally for black people. Like, oh, like you need to have a track record and you need to have this. And it's like, you actually don't need those things. Like if I can like get comfortable with some other stuff, but it's like, if you don't know the board member, or you don't know the CIO, or you know, if you don't have other LPs who I trust and kind of can remove this, like cover your ass, then I'm not willing to like make that borderline slightly uh, lighter. Right. And so we saw that dramatically, like every institution we got in front of one was literally our, our business school uh, teacher at HBS was on the board of one of the foundations. Um, a board member of another foundation actually went to my college alma mater and reached out, right. Um, partners at KKR were investors and like, it was just common. And so same thing for fun too. We realized like, Hey, we can't waste time trying to go through the normal process of these institutions. We have to figure out, who do we know who can be an advocate for us that's on the board and knows the CIO? Like the reality is for us, we're like, you know, some people kind of say it's like not the best strategy. Like we're like, we don't want to talk to any middlemen at large institutions. Like it's just not going to work. Like, hey, like we have this like 30 year old black man who's on a second fund, like the associate brought it to committee. Like, good luck. <laughs> it's just not going to work. But you need the board member to come in and say, oh yeah, like my, you know, good friend, we are, our kids go to the same uh, school. And I, we, you know, and his friend invested a million bucks. Like he said, he's really smart. Like that's how it works for us. Um, and so I think that's just a reality that we saw. And it's a reality for a lot of black managers is people just aren't able to mentally remove these like borders that they have for the checklist. And then it, it sucks because they do it for, for white managers all the time. I think that that's such a good point, Ani. I wanted to also talk about um, how LPs can be useful, not just from an investment perspective, but also from a larger kind of like ecosystem perspective. And so I don't know if I said this in, in the last story explicitly, but the person who introduced me to Precursor was an LP and Precursor. And so I don't know if I would have gotten this role if I didn't get introduced by an LP. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity for LPs to be more active in diversifying funds that they're a part of by also being a part of networks, organizations, institutions, um, where they're close to folks who, who should be VCs. And so um, I think that LPs, it just seems like there's a lot of opportunity for them to do additional work. And I think that's the problem. It's additional work. Um, but I think it's also additional impact that they can have if they stepped up um, a little more across not just being investors in funds, but also being a part of the fund strategy more generally, especially as it comes to um, diversity. I, I've been holding back here because I have very strong thoughts um, and will uh, self-censor some of my stronger thoughts. 
I think it's worth taking a, a little bit of a step back and just really examining and, and reminding ourselves where a lot of these dollars come from. Like, yes, we deal with middlemen and fund the funds many times and fund managers, but a lot of the dollars start at the state level, at pension funds, at the city level, at pension funds. You pick some of the bigger states, California, uh, Texas, New York, a lot of those dollars are created on the backs and careers of people that look like us. And then there's this conversation at the board that doesn't look like us or the investment committee that doesn't look like us. And less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of those dollars allocated for alternative asset managers then go in the hands of managers that look like the people that created the dollars in the first place. But you really have to sit there and think through that cycle and how that money doesn't flow. Um, so for me, everything that was said is, is correct, but what really needs to happen um, is a renewal of what I saw at the beginning of my career, kind of the tail end of more political advocacy from fund managers like ourselves, uh, from our advisors who get dollars from these pension funds that we don't. Um, and in concert, we have to be able to put pressure on these folks to say, hey, this system is broken. Like you cannot take pension fund and pensioner dollars from people that look a certain way in your city, in your state, in your ecosystem, and then disprop not disproportionately, like almost 100% allocated to people that don't look like those folks that created the pool of capital, that then only invest in people that don't look like the people that create that capital, which ultimately builds wealth in communities where the dollar wasn't rooted in the first place. Like you really have to sit there and think through that. And once you do, it's kind of up to us to come up with a plan to, to change that. Um, because while some of us might have connections, I'm lucky to do many of the org organizations or schools that were mentioned, the majority of us don't. Um, and in, unless we start where the dollars are rooted and, and try to come up with a plan to change that or at least ad address that in concert, my big fear is that the funds that had success fundraising post George Floyd, that it's moment in time capital. And those LPs said, okay, well, now's a good time for us to take, you know, half of 1% of our AUM that we allocate. Let's go find some black managers. Let's do the thing. And now that the market's getting a little spookier, paper marks are coming down, liquidity is coming down. Our allocations are shifting away maybe from alternatives because we're overweighted there right now. That moment in time capital is gone. And then what happens when you need to raise the next fund? Um, so I think it, like all of these dynamics have to go back to the root of where the dollars start. Uh, and that's probably a whole nother Zoom call, but I, I think it's hard to have this conversation without at least eliminating that dynamic. But how do you guys think about doing this? Because I'd love to get involved in something like that. Um, I don't know if it's Black BC, I don't know if it's one in addition to the Black Panther Party, but so just someone takes up the mantle. I know Will has talked about this a lot, a lot, and I've talked to others who have, who have just like brought this idea to to bear. And I'd love to hear like, how do we how do we do this? Let's go. I'm in. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's just putting together a consortium, and we kind of have to do a bit of a roadshow, like when the time makes sense. And maybe not everyone can go to every meeting, but we got to sit down with these cats. And it's not just. The investment committee managers but it's politicians it's people that really influence their world and getting everyone to sit down and honestly the power of uh i think the internet actually changes this experience from even 16 years ago or 17 years ago when i was seeing the prior generation of venture capitalists try to have this the difference is when we have these conversations and these meetings they end up spreading wide when I started in 2005, 2006, like we were having meetings on Capitol Hill. Shout out uh, Bob Green at NAIC, he still does this work. Um, but it's just like there's a bit of a disconnect from that generation in ours where I think they've got awesome perspectives and experiences. We've got different platforms and different reach and different ways. And we really just need to sit down um, and, and kind of chart out a plan because like if we don't make some of these structural changes and advancements, we're going to have this Zoom call for the next 15 to 25 Black History Month panels. And, and it'll go up and down, left and right. But, you know, the last 
in my seat, I get questions from LPs all the time, meeting with Roman numeral one, two, and three investors that are awesome, some of which are on this call. And the first question I get is, well, what's the difference between Harlem Capital and Precursor? And like, we've got to like, we've really got to like start at the root of this thing, because that is an, an offensive question if you ask me. I mean, it is a question. It's very offensive. Yeah, but it's it happens all the time. time. And I, I like, we have to, in unison, um, really start to tackle that. And I'll just finish because I know we're running out of time and I won't speak anymore. But one of the, the things that Sydney said earlier, which is, you know, do we, um, do we push black venture capitalists to starting their own funds or do we push black venture capitalists to go through the journey of navigating, you know, bigger non-black funds? I think that answer is we have to do both. Again, we have to do it really effectively and do it collectively and lean on each other to make sure that everyone's successful, regardless of the path that you choose. But in, in order for the ecosystem to work for capital allocators and then ultimately founders, it's got to be on both sides. Um, so this is, you know, a good reminder, I think, that we need to, while managing our funds, manage kind of the movement uh, and as well as kind of the ecosystem that we're all trying to see, you know, five, 10 years from now. So we, we can't wrap up Black History Month in a question, but if we could, I, I'd love to hear each of you just take 15, 30 seconds. What's making you nervous right now and what's making you excited right now about the trajectory of venture capital? Um, and I'll, I'll start with Sydney and then we'd love to hear from Henri and then Elliot. Oh man, nervous. Um, I've actually been, I've, I've just been really happy over this last month or two with all of the growth in um, the absolute number of black investors, the, uh, the growth of black funds, the number of black funds. It feels like something's changing, um, at least to me. And so that has given me a lot of calm. I think, especially as I think through, um, you know, backing black founders, making sure that I have communities of black investors on every stack. There's still a lot of, there's still a lot, long way to go, but like Jessica Patton just announced her fundraise at 5CP a few days ago. And it just feels like there's, there's something in the water that's changing. And so that feels good. And so nervousness is, I think, and I think actually, Henri, you might have tweeted about this a few days ago. It's just like, how do we continue to just um, continue to keep it up? Because it's a lot of work. And so how do we do this sustainably? How do we be thoughtful about the pressure that we're putting on ourselves and others? How do we take breaks? Um, because this is not this is not a one-year thing. This is a lifetime thing. This is a multiple lifetime thing. Awesome. Um, nervous, I would say like that people are going to want to do this for a long time. People, black people, it's a really long game. I think, you know, venture and startups, like it's sexy now and there's a lot of capital toward us. And, you know, we see a lot of emerging managers, um, since we invest in funds on the side now too. And like my number one question is like, okay, great. But like, why are you uniquely qualified to do this? I think sometimes that answer isn't that strong. It's kind of more like, I want to help black people, but like, why through this method? And so I get nervous about that because I know, you know, the reality is you, you hear, you can talk to John Rogers, of, you know, aerial management when they went from whatever it was, 32 billion of AUM to like four, eight billion post the recession, right? Like black people managers, like will always get hit worse in downturns, right? And so I think, you know, the, you kind of have that, that knowledge and, and Willie from ICB told me like, you always know like there's that extra pressure, like particularly like we're like super public, right? Like if Harlem Capital fucks up, like I know the impacts are gonna impact a lot of me. Similar to like Elliot's point, when we were fundraising fund one, like the number one question we got was like, how are you different from backstage, right? It's like, well, they're in California and like they're, you know, there can't be two black funds like in the entire country, right? Like, so it's just a reality. And so you know it, and so it's an extra weight. and so. I get nervous that some black managers don't understand that we and like the downstream implications, you know, for better or for worse. It's not like 
we should put that extra pressure on ourselves, but it's a reality. And if you get, you know, big enough and you're public enough, like we are, like there will be impacts regardless. And so I, you know, I, I bear that burden, but I don't know if some others do. Um, what makes me excited is I think there will be more black unicorns this year than all years combined. Um, and the CSU went in, you know, in January, I, I know of one that will probably happen this month as well. And so I think there's going to be a lot and that makes me excited that there's more growth equity happening for black founders. I think it's going to be a really big year, even with the markets down. I think there's a lot of black founders who are well positioned. Um, and I'm excited to see more capital going, uh, into their, their hands. Yeah, I mean, without a doubt, the biggest fear I have, and Henri touched on it, is that as a lot of the projected liquidity is coming back because of kind of multiple contraction and the market pullback, LPs are thinking differently about the next one to five years of deployment and alternative asset managers. And typically, if you look at the last two big cycles, that those dollars or what's left um, or what they allocate <clears throat> they typically go back to what they knew. And those are funds that have been around a long time, managers that they know, managers that have returned liquidity. And what's happened is in the past three to four years of really, you know, big leaps forward for fund managers of color, particularly black fund managers, is we made awesome investments. Those investments have raised follow on capital, paper marks exist. But if either the pathway to liquidity is pushed out by a year or two, just because like the markets are choppier or some of those paper, paper marks don't hold the same weight that they did. My fear is that what I saw happen in 08, 09 is some folks don't make it. Um, and again, it's why I think us as a collective sitting down with some LPs and talking about that before it happens uh, is actually really important. And the only other fear that I have is I'm a little nervous about the rise of the digital persona in venture capital. Um, that's probably more kind of race agnostic. But one thing that's really unique for people of color is that people not of color like to back stories, not necessarily people or investment practices. And I'm, I'm increasingly nervous when I talk to um, Caucasian primarily fund managers or high net worth people who want to back stories because stories are moment in time. They're not necessarily institutional stories change, they evolve. And the story that you might present today might be very different three years from now for whatever reason. And I'm, I'm very nervous um, about how that evolves over time. And what I'm most excited about is the rise of black women in venture capital, like without a doubt. Um, you know, you mentioned Megan. Megan was the first person I talked to this morning. Um, there is just like the talent pool of black women in venture. I'm not going to say ages here. Let's say tenure between two and 10 years of venture capital is just fascinating. It's powerful. It's phenomenal. I've been really lucky that in the last seven years of my career, women have totally outperformed the men that I've been investing alongside and working alongside. And seeing the rise of black women and how they're they're changing the game is what I'm most excited about. Thank you so much, Sydney, Henri, Elliot, for joining us today. This conversation has illustrated so powerfully the points that are outlined in the State of Black Venture Report, as well as the importance and challenges and accomplishments that black venture investors are experiencing today. I'd also like to thank Silicon Valley Bank for partnering with us to create this report. Their help was instrumental in producing it. I'd also like to thank our sponsors, without which Black VC could not have gotten to where it is today. They have been instrumental to the success of this organization. I encourage you to go download the State of Black Venture Report on the blackvc.org website, as well as to look there for our programs, sponsors, and additional information. Thank you all for coming today. We look forward to building the future of venture capital with you going forward.